to the 98th episode of Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. Now, when I'm editing together all the different segments that go together to make up the program for each episode, I often think about what kind of mood is emerging from the content, because there definitely are different levels of energy or different types of energy in each episode. And I think I can say that today's content is decidedly harmonious and peaceful and calming. Well, at least all of our extra content is, because obviously I'm not quite sure what Andrew and I are going to get up to <laughs> on the couch here yet, but I don't think we've planned anything too extravagant or mischievous, have well, it we? may be a surprise in store yet. <laughs> <laughs> we've got two guests for you today, uh, two very different people, but both doing really inspiring work. Our feature interview guest is the UK designer. Designer Rhea Burns, who recently completed a master's degree in textiles and design, and she's since started her own label. Rhea's passion is creating sustainable knitwear, so she takes wool from a local eco farm and hand dyes it using vegetable waste or plants from her own garden or foraged from the local area. If you're a keen gardener, you'll love hearing about using local plants for dyeing. She then takes the yarn and creates machine knitted garments and accessories in her own designs. Andrea did this interview during the Shetland Wool Week yeah. where Rhea was teaching classes. She's young and fresh and has a ton of interesting information, so I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting her. And we've also got a mini interview with the Norwegian designer Sissel Hurjevik, who we had on the show two years ago back in episode 30. So Sissel's a very experienced designer. She's been working in the industry for many, many years. And during the Swiss Yarn Festival back in February, she was teaching classes on how to embellish your hand knits with embroidery and crochet. So Cicel and I sat down together to take a closer look at exactly how she does that and what kinds of techniques she's using. And I was really encouraged to see that she's really only using the very basic embroidery stitches and crochet techniques that are fairly straightforward for a knitter to learn. And if you're able to add just small amounts of these other crafts to your hand knits, the results can look really interesting and very beautiful. And it can also give you another layer of enjoyment with your making. So you're going to enjoy that interview as well. And we stay in Switzerland and we take you to the very beautiful historic town Stein am Rhein. And we look at some amazing frescoes that are painted on 15th century buildings. These are really extraordinary frescoes. You're going to love seeing them. And Andrew gives us a very brief history lesson as a prelude. So it's only three minutes. It's a lot of fun. So you'll yep. enjoy that too. <laughs> And then to round off the whole program, there's an update on my knitting and Andrew started a new knitting project. And there's also some talk about washing and caring for your hand knits. I'm up first in under construction with my new project here. Last episode, we showed you a design by Kim Hargraves that I was considering knitting for Andrea. It was an ideal project for me really because it was all stocking stitch and garter stitch, which are my particular specialities in knitting. <laughs> Uh, since then, I have decided to be a little bit more ambitious, push myself a little. New design, still largely stocking stitch, but it does include uh, a lace panel. Yeah. You might remember some time ago, I did tackle the Shetland bird's eye lace pattern, uh, which I really enjoyed. I really liked doing it. I never did a full project, but I will come back to that sometime, the, yeah. the bird's eye pattern itself. And that's a difficult lace pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And I did, I sort of did okay, but never brought it to an end. Anyway, let's have a look at a picture of the new design. So the design is by Martin Story and it's published in the Rowan magazine number 61, which is the 2016 spring summer collection. We interviewed Martin Story in episode 72, if you'd like to check him out. The design is done in pieces and it's bottom up and that lace panel is only on the front part. So uh, I've got plenty of peaceful, stress-free knitting to do before I get to that. It's a light spring summer design that Andrea loves and I'm using a DK weight wool cotton blend called Duo from the Norwegian company Sandnes Garn. Garn, by the way, just means yarn um, in Norwegian, also in German, so that's kind of easy for us. Yeah. Um, we've got a few of these Rowan magazines and it's really good to be able to go back and to knit more designs from them. Yeah. Yeah, we've actually done a few from this one. This one, um, as you said, came out in 2016. Yep. And this picture here, you might remember that our daughter Madeline knitted this jumper for herself. 
and it's that that design's called Lantic, and it's by the designer Sarah Hatton, and that one uses the soft yak DK. Yeah, and the vest that I'm wearing is also out of that book. Uh, this is called Welk, and it's another Martin Story design. So Martin Story is featuring today. He is heavily. Yep. Okay, so back to this one. Yep. So I have started on the back piece. It's going really well. Um, I thought I was knitting really quickly. I was very <laughs> satisfied. And then right after I'd actually thought that you said something, I can't remember exactly what you said, but it was either you're knitting very slowly or you can knit faster. I'm going to get in trouble now. There's yeah. going to be all these no, no, comments. It's okay. <laughs> telling me not to know, be mean to you. You can say whatever you want. I don't really mind. <laughs> anyway. I think it's because I wanted, I wanted him to get onto the technique of flicking, flicking. because flicking is going to make him move faster naturally. And it'll help the, the tension between the pearl rose and the knit rose. Yeah, well, that's interesting. We'll see when that happens. <laughs> if um, that happens. Anyway, Andrea has done a quality. So the, the performance, as far as the speed, there's still a question over that. But Andrea has done a quality control check on this. And the report was that it's pretty good. <laughs> it is pretty good. The, it's diff It's better. I don't know if you remember, maybe it was last year that Andrew knitted the a little cotton jumper for our that's right. niece, Simba, with a tiger's head on it. Well, mm. the, with cotton, it does show up how even you are. Yeah. It it's partic particularly shows up more so than wool. This is 50-50 wool and cotton. Yeah. And I think this is actually neater than that yeah, one. So, so I, I am, think you are improving. Yeah, I am being yeah. really careful to try to keep the tension up a little bit on my pearl rose, which yeah. is the problem that I had. So I think that's yeah. going pretty well. Um, yep. Yeah, so doing that, the other thing that we noticed, which is really funny, I think, is that my gauge perfectly matches the pattern gauge. Which is excellent. So not only does his stitch row... Um, match, but, match the, but the the row gauge yeah the stitch gauge matches and the row gauge yeah which is good because um the pattern you want the pattern to end at the right spot so when we get to this lace i mean i suppose the lace gauge is a different story altogether i think that that'll but fit still, in but that the, the you might helps. remember from the picture that that it sort of goes in zigzags like this and it has to end at a certain point up at the collar and it's a raglan sleeve so yep. you, you've got to do your – it'll make it easy. We don't have to recalculate yeah, anything. it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to push through the back, and then after that I'll be onto the front. I am thinking that I'll do a nice – a swatch, a big swatch, but still just a swatch uh, to practice the lace, try to get the pattern under control, and also make sure the tension there is okay because I don't take that for granted. Um, I just figure it's going to be easier to rip out the swatch than it would be to rip out the, the beginning of the front. So Yeah, even I do that. If, you just, if you've got a new pattern, whether it's a stitch pattern or even a different um, a ferrule pattern, stranded pattern, just by practicing it once on a swatch, that means you're going to, you'll, you'll be faster next time, but you'll also be neater mm. significantly. In fact, you can even sometimes see the difference between sleeve one and sleeve two. Sleeve two will be more sort of uh, fluent. Wonky. No, fluent, because okay. you've already done a full pattern yeah, yeah. and you come through it again and just everything is smoother, I think. Yep. I think you can see that. You're always lopsided. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well done. I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah. it's in a really lovely, warm honey colour. Yeah, it's a spring-summer design, so... Pressure's, pressure's on. on. <laughs> yeah, for you. <laughs> okay. So we're staying with Under Construction with me for my project. Here it is. It's called Sky. It's by Marie Wallen. It comes from her North Sea collection, which is a collection of eight patterns, and they're all done with Rowan Felted Tweed. That's a fantastic yarn. I can highly recommend it. I've used it many times, but this time I wanted to use a different yarn as a substitute. And I've chosen the Hampshire Four Ply from the Grey Sheep Company. So that's their natural undyed shade here. And this salmon pink is called Rosehip. If you'd like to learn more about the yarn and the, the sheep and the farm that this yarn comes from, we did a full feature interview with Emma Boyles who's the owner of the Grey Sheep Company back in episode 52. And that's a really good interview. So here we go. Now, what's interesting to me is every time I start a new garment project and garments are what I really love knitting, I, I just recognize that I oscillate between two states. One is really excited and confident about my project and the other is less sure, doubtful, and even disgruntled about the project. <laughs> Disgruntled. Well, yeah, I know it's me. quite strong, but I do 
recognize that I, I do these cycles. Anyway, I'm happy to say that today you're catching me moving out of the state of disgruntlement into the state of more contentment. So I've mainly just got positive things to say. But I have had a challenge, and I'll tell you about it in just a minute. Just to recap, the designs knitted bottom up and in the round, and you do that on the body and the sleeves to the armhole, then you join them all together and you knit the yoke in one piece. And this is sort of where the, the challenge was for me, because this all over uh, twisted stitch pattern here, which is, creates a really beautiful texture, I really love the texture of that, that's a 30 uh, row pattern repeat, so and that takes about 10 centimeters to get through. So from about here to here, that's one pattern repeat, and it's got 30 rows in it. And the pattern says to knit the body up to a, a certain length and knit the sleeve up to a certain length, but you have to end on both the body and the sleeves on the same pattern row. And that's because once you join them all together, you're going to continue knitting in pattern for at least another three centimeters. Now, the problem with that is that it doesn't give you a lot of wriggle room if you want to do a custom fit because it's 30 rows in a pattern. Mm -hmm. So you can't kind of do another full pattern repeat or you're going to have really long arms. Yeah. Particularly for me because I want to keep the body like you can see how short and cropped it is. I want it short and cropped because I want to be able to wear it with a full skirt. And for my figure, it looks better if I keep it sort of neat in my, in my waist. It'll look better. So I want to keep the body short and cropped, but I want to add an extra couple of centimeters on my arms. And I can't really do that with, with this kind of arrangement. So the... Uh, so the other thing I have to do as well, and, and this is sort of a bit of a problem with bottom-up designs, is that you don't really know how long the sleeve length is going to be until you've put the, the sleeves together with the body and you've knitted up the yoke. Because the depth of the yoke also determines how long the sleeves are going to be. If the, the, the yoke is quite deep, the armhole is also going to be deep. And the deeper the armhole is, then the longer the sleeves are going to end up being. Now, Marie writes that the, the yoke is going to have a depth of 27 centimetres, which for me sounds really quite deep, quite long. You know, when I, when I measure that on me, that seems to be quite long. On top of that, she also doesn't put in short row shaping at the back neck to raise the back neck up higher. And I will definitely want to do that because I don't like having a garment that's sort of up here, but lower yeah. at the back. And that might add even more length to the depth of my yoke. So I'm not sure how that goes. And then of course you knit it all up and then you find, oh dear, the sleeves are too short or too long and then you have to un unrip to be able to do any modification. So what I'm going to do, there are all the juggling things I have to do. So I'm going to stop here, even though my sleeves are a little bit too short for what I want. And I'm then going to just knit slowly, or not knit slowly, but stop every two centimeters or so and check try it on measure it so that if I do need to rip back I rip back at the earliest possible moment the other thing is if I complete the whole thing and I find that my sleeves are too short I do have another little trick up my sleeve and that is I can chop it off here and just add in a few centimeters of something, or other. of something or other, and that'll give me length. Now, let me tell you why I want to make my sleeves longer. <laughs> the other day, I counted how many jumpers I've knitted myself, and I, I don't know whether I feel a little bit guilty or a little bit proud in telling you this, but I have knitted myself 25 woolen jumpers. They're just the woolen jumpers. And, but let me, in my own defense, let me just say that I wear my jumpers every single day of the year, except for about five or six at the most weeks in the height of summer. And even then, sometimes you can easily have a, a cardigan on. Yeah. So I'm literally wearing my jumper, my jumpers every single day. I don't feel like I'm properly dressed unless I've got one of my own garments on. And even when we're here alone, because we're all in lockdown now, but this is not so different from our normal life. We normally just work at home in, in isolation anyway. But so even when I'm at home, I'm always wearing my garments. 
So when Madeline comes to, Madeline is our daughter, when she comes home, she often just goes in my cupboards and tries on some of my jumpers. And she's got the same coloring as me. So anything that I've knitted that suits me looks stunning on her. She's also got the same shaped torso or the same size torso, but she is taller than me. So her arms, both her arms and her legs are longer. And so she tries my jumpers on. And let me also say that if you've knitted 25 jumpers and you wear them every day, sometimes you can get a little bit blasé about them. So what was originally a stunning jumper, you might end up thinking... And precious. And precious. Yeah. You might end up thinking as well, it's a, it's a jumper, it's good, but it's not as fantastic as you might have originally thought. But when she tries them on, they just kind of come alive again and they look really special and she looks gorgeous in them and, and it just gives them new life. And she looks stunning except that they're all about this much too short on her arms. And that's just a real shame. So I thought from now on, every time I knit myself a jumper, I'm going to knit them with sleeves that are just two centimeters too long for me, because I think I can get away with it without it really being noticeable. And then they'll be either perfect for her or maybe a tiny bit on the, on the short side. Mm. But it gives those jumpers two lives. They can have a life with me and a life with Madeline. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to visit the beautiful town of Stein am Rhein, which dates back to around 1000 AD. The town's really famous even within Switzerland because of the preservation of its architectural heritage. There's in the town centre, there's a pedestrian area with buildings which date back, like Andrea said, back to the 15th century AD. And many of these buildings are painted with beautiful murals or frescoes as they're called. Now, I'd always thought that a fresco was just a mural, like a standard mural painting on a wall. But actually the term fresco refers to a particular technique for creating that painting. A fresco is created by painting on wet lime plaster. When the plaster sets, the painting becomes an integral part of the wall. That means that the fresco is really durable, which means that it's an ideal a technique for using painting on outside walls. The word fresco comes from the Italian word for fresh, which refers to the wet plaster. Because the painting had to be completed before the plaster dried, frescoes are often broken up into smaller sections that could each be painted in a single day. These sections are called giornata, which is literally means day, but it is generally translated as a day's work. Again, from the Italian, you probably know the expression buongiorno, which means good day. On a large fresco, you may be able to see the seams between these sections. And if you count these sections, then you'll know how long the painter took to create the fresco. That's so cool. Yeah, it's really <laughs> funny. As the plaster dries, there's a chemical reaction which fixes the colors of the pigments in the plaster. And that's kind of like the mordant in yarn dye. Yeah. Okay. And one limitation of the fresco technique is that this process doesn't work for some uh, pigments. And that includes the pigments which were commonly used for blue coloring. So the solution to this problem was a technique which is called a seckle. And seckle means dry. So it's contrast with fresh fresco, okay, yeah. which means wet or fresh, seckle, and seckle, a seckle technique just means you're painting on the dried plaster afterwards. That technique was much more fragile than what they call true fresco. And that means that over time, the you might have a fresco which is done in both techniques. Yeah. So the, the blue bit would be done with a seckle and the rest is done with true fresco. The parts that are done in a seckle would wear away. Yeah. And so they might be lost. So okay. that's how it went. You might see that if you look at these frescoes somewhere. Anyway, now that we know all about the technique, I'm gonna show you one example in Stein am Rhein, which has a really good story to it. This building here is the Gasthaus zur Sonne, which means the Sun Guest House. The building itself dates back to 1448, but the fresco was done in 1900, and it depicts the meeting of Alexander the Great with the philosopher Diogenes. Now, Diogenes believed in a simple life and had no respect for either wealth or power. And in the picture here, we see Diogenes in the ceramic barrel or jar, people call it, where he lived. So he's obviously living a very simple life. Alexander the Great, on the other hand, is considered to be one of the most successful military leaders ever. He built a huge empire and was obviously massively wealthy and powerful, but he was still excited to meet the philosopher Diogenes. Because he was pretty famous, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So apparently when, when Alexander meets Diogenes, and you do have to remember Alexander could essentially 
give Diogenes anything. Alexander said to Diogenes, is there any favor that I can grant you? Anything you want, I'm, you know, I'm here, I can give you anything. And Diogenes is down in the barrel yeah, looking probably, up. <laughs> yeah, and I imagine Diogenes was probably looking pretty grubby. Yeah, didn't, scruffy looking in Didn't his have barrel. any food or anything like that, a bit skinny. Diogenes looks up and Alexander's there and Diogenes says to Alexander, yep, yeah, look, just move aside a little, you're standing in my sunlight. <laughs> so that's what Diogenes wanted. Um, I did one other interesting bit of information that I found out in my reading about this. Diogenes was or is, is considered to be one of the founders of the uh, ancient cynics, which is a school of philosophical thought, which believes that to be happy, people need to return to the simplicity of nature and they need to reject the social norms and conventions and desires. The cynics thought that people were essentially good, but that the accepted practice of striving for wealth and power and um, fame leads you down to a bad life, it leads you away from a good life. And so the cynics gave up all their worldly possessions. That was one of their key things. And it meant that they, yeah. and people said, you're living like dogs, right? And Diogenes, they were obviously trying to be insulting, but Diogenes said, actually, that's a good point. <laughs> the dogs are exactly a good role model for us here. They're setting us a good, good example. They, they live in the moment. They don't have unnecessary possessions or distractions and they're happy. And they also know their friends. Yeah. So, so actually, for all of us who have faithful hounds at home, during our present lockdown, we can actually look to our dogs for some guidance because yep. chances are they're just sitting there wagging their tails, just yeah. blissfully happy in, in this moment, moment yep. and then in the next moment. <laughs> yeah, but they, they, they say that because of that, the word cynic is actually taken from the Greek word for dog. So that's one theory as to where it came from. It's not, not definitive, but that's one theory. Yep. And I had one other story about Diogenes, yeah. if I may. Yes, he's, he's an interesting character. He's a very interesting, there are lots of stories. He was on a boat, so he was traveling somewhere, I don't know where, and the boat was captured by pirates and everyone on the boat was sold as a slave. And when they were selling them all off, they said, all right, what's your trade? What are your skills? What are you good for? And they got to Diogenes and Diogenes says, I'm a governor of men. Anyone who's looking for a master should buy me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was bought and he lived out most of his life as a slave or the rest of his life. This is what they think. I hope his master appreciated his sense of humour. There are, there are some stories that say that they did eventually. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. What a character. Absolutely. That's yeah. amazing. Okay, so coming up now is this footage, which is really beautiful, of these amazing frescoes and, and just the very beautiful town, Stein am Rhein. And straight after that, you're going to learn how you can embellish your knitwear with crochet and embroidery.
So joining me now is the Norwegian designer Sitsul Hujevik. Now Sitsul is highly skilled in a number of different crafts from crochet, embroidery, sewing as well as knitting and her designs are a clever combination of all of these techniques put together which create really beautiful and ornate fabrics and I'm wearing one of her designs which I really enjoyed knitting. <laughs> Compliments. It's yeah. very nice. You look really beautiful in it. It's mm. a stunning design. Mm. So it's really great to have you back on Fruity Knitting. And I'm very happy to be here. Good. Good to meet you finally. Yeah. Live. Yeah. So we did a full feature interview on Sitzel two years ago and that was back in episode 30. Now for the viewers who haven't seen that interview, can you introduce us briefly to your work, like the concept of your work? So how would you describe your design aesthetic and where do you get your inspiration from? Uh, my designs are often very feminine. I uh, make a lot of jackets, uh, sweaters, uh, sometimes even dresses, but uh, mostly jackets because most of them are in wool. So, and uh, I get inspiration from uh, from a lot of things, from nature, from light, from uh, folkloristic costumes, uh, traditional costumes. Very often, I uh, use uh, traditional patterns or I get inspiration from them. I like to add very many different things like uh, embroidery, crochet, ribbons too, ribbons, yeah, uh, beads and sequins. So I like to make them feminine. Mm. And sparkly. And very sparkly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you do an interesting use of colour. So tell us a little bit about what you like, how you like to use colour. Yeah, um, I like all kinds of colours uh, actually. Some of my models are very very soft with natural tones and some are very very vivid uh, but uh, sometimes when you use too much color that much it gets very uh, very f um, predictable or boring a bit. yeah boring i think they look boring so i i like to add another color maybe sometimes a color i don't really like but uh, it gives uh, something exciting to the rest of the colors something that really clashes but yeah. it does, doesn't it cannot be too much yeah just a little little uh, accent or... accent that uh, gives life to the other colors yeah so um, yeah. but i like all kinds of colors yeah and what about the yarns tell us about the yarns that you're using yeah when i first started i wanted to use uh, yarns from a lot of uh, producers but uh, little by little i settled for hillesvog which is norwegian uh, family run uh, yarn mill uh, last year they com they celebrated 120 years 120 yeah, years with the same wow. family all the time yeah so it's the fourth generation running this company right now yeah. i have a very good uh, collaboration with them um they have a lot of qualities but i mostly use three which is usk that is 100 percent norwegian wool and then it's sølje which is slightly thinner uh, it's norwegian pelt wool mm -hmm. and uh, vilja that is Norwegian lamb's wool. So I mostly use these uh, three uh, qualities. Now my products are 100% Norwegian, which yes. was not really meant from the beginning of, but uh, since I, I do sell a lot to abroad, uh, I think it's a nice, it's nice thing that is so almost 100% Norwegian. Yeah, mm. definitely. Mm. Now, Sitzel's teaching three classes during the festival, and one of those classes is how to embellish your knitwear with embroidery. Mm. So why do you like to use embroidery so much, and what, which um, types of embroidery stitches do you use the most? Yes, I really like to, to add, uh, to add uh, embroidery to my knitting because m almost all the time I use two uh, colors in my knitting. Yeah. So uh, then it's never too complicated yeah. and uh, you don't get the long threads on the back side uh, or the wrong side of the, uh, your work and um, you can add so much extra color yeah. to your knitting. So uh, you can add one color, you can uh, add a lot of colors to it and uh, I usually use four stitches and uh, that is duplicate stitches, the chain stitches uh, bullion stitches and French knots. Those are the main st stitches that I use. Okay, so can you show us how you do that? And, yes. And some examples of how you've used it. Yes. Uh, here's one jacket. Um, this is just knitted with two colors and here I added duplicate stitches here. So it's kind of a shadow more or less. And uh, on this one, here I have a lot of uh, techniques. I have duplicate stitches in here. so. It gives really much, but I have other uh, stitches too. 
here I have a good example. This jacket is knitted all around in two colors. All this you see here is uh, duplicate stitches. Okay. So I filled in the motifs here. And do you have a special way of working the duplicate stitch? Is there any special techniques or tricks we need to know about? Uh, yes. Um, I usually um, work uh, sideways okay. and downwards. Okay. Never up and down. Because uh, in this way, I, it covers the best. You don't see very much of the background when you, you work this way. First I made one line here from uh, right to the left and then I go this way back again and um, I don't go through the whole knitting. I just go under the top layer. Okay, and that helps to cover the, the yes, color I think behind. So. Mm, I think so. Mm. And you don't have really have to be a super knitter to to make uh, my garments. Many, many people think so. But uh, most of all, I say that you need uh, some patience. And uh, sometimes I'm not really happy with uh, a color that I've chosen. I get to work back the the finished uh, knitted garment from a knitter. And I said, oh, I, I didn't like that color. So but th that's my fault. So sometimes I use uh, duplicate stitches to cover up the first color. Like uh, this one. It was in pink, but I didn't like it at all. So I covered it all up with uh, red and uh, you can you can hardly see the color. Uh, and next I make a lot of chain stitches too. Um, I use them around the motif to make a border like this. And uh, also like uh, this in brown. Yeah, mm. and you've got some on your garment there, haven't yes. you? Yes, yes. First I make one uh, chain stitch, or four uh, chain stitches, and then I make a, a new chain stitch inside the other one. And this one is on uh, on top of a small crochet flower. And the petals are also chain also stitches, chain stitches yeah. but with two threads, so double. Okay. Mm. And then you've got the little knots, the French knots. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I have them here in the middle of this little swatch and you make them like this and I start up in in the thread not in a hole okay. so it gets um, something to hold on to and you might put about four of those in the center is that right and yeah four or as, uh, as many as you, uh, you like I like to keep them very tight in a group so they're very decorative in the middle of a flower for example then I also use the bullion stitch. It's uh, related to the, the French knot. It's a little longer. Uh, I use them very much. It's also. very pretty. Mm, it is. I so like here it. you've mm. put a button in and there you've got yes. the French knot. Yes. So there's so many ways to play yeah. around with, this, um, yeah. with the, uh, these stitches. Yeah, it's mm. really gorgeous. And you've got them here as well yes. as the center of the rose. Mm. Okay, now nearly all, all of your designs also have some details that are done in crochet. Mm. So tell us a little bit about why you like to use the crochet, because you do use the crochet stitch in a lot of different ways. Yes. And um, what can the, the crochet stitch give you that a knitting stitch can't? Yes, I very much like to add uh, crochet details to my, uh, to my uh, knitting. First of all, because I think that, especially around the edges, it gives it... Um, a professional touch, yeah. uh, stability, and you can fix small mistakes. I finish all my garments with uh, with uh, these stitches, and uh, most of them are quite uh, simple too. Yeah. Okay, tell us back about here, because mm. you've actually knitted this, first of all, in stripes, haven't you? That's right. And then left columns of, of pearl stitches. Yes, that's right. And then you've done a single crochet Yes. Up the top, is that right? Yes, yeah. that's right. So I, I pull out the thread mm -hmm. from the back side. It's always from the back. So these are slip stitches going in these pearl, rows of pearl stitches. And since, uh, since uh, they are pearled, uh, when you work uh, the uh, slip stitches in net, uh, they get down in yeah, the, the, the knitting. Okay, so it doesn't creates lay on a little top. ridge. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So you don't have to you don't have to use more threads and having the floats on the back side on the wrong side. Uh, you can go work long way with just one color yeah. at a time. Yeah, so that's great. You, mm. 
Okay, and what about here? Is this done in crochet as well? Yes, that's also crochet. First I have one row of, um, of uh, the slip stitches and then I have these chain stitches. Uh, it depends how long you want this uh, curled uh, frilly fringes as you call them. <laughs> <laughs> I always said the spiral fringes. Yeah. I just had to invent a name. Uh, so if you make uh, 20 chain stitches, for example, you, you fasten off the, the, the thread yeah. on the hook, yeah. twirl it around, okay. and you go back. Ah, so yeah. you put so the it, twist in it and yes. then, then secure mm. it. Yeah, and then you go just, you can form it, you can shape it a little like this. So you can get, uh, you can make them as long as you like. Yeah. Mm. Another one of your signature features of your designs is mm. the very unique way you do buttonholes. So mm. I thought maybe you could show us some examples of those and explain yes. how you do it. Yes. Okay, a few years ago I wanted to make di a little different button bands. So uh, I wanted, I didn't want to copy everybody else's, and I think um, I thought that uh, the knitted uh, button bands were kind of boring. So I started to make a new kind of button bands that started with a few rows of, uh, of uh, knitting. I can show it here. I start to pick up uh, stitches along the front and the, the neck of my jacket and I knit one uh, row from uh, the wrong side. So then I have a pearl ridge here and then I knit uh, three rows of stocking stitches. I knit one row from the wrong side again, so I have a new uh, pearl uh, ridge. Finally I knit uh, four, five uh, rows of stocking stitches. Uh, depends how much you need to to, clo uh, to cover up the, Steak. the steaks, yes. This row of pearl stitches I decorate in later. And here I continue with the um, my crochet, uh, usually crochet three, board, uh, three rows back and forth. Uh, and I make the button holes on the first row, uh, that's simply three, four uh, chain stitches, and skip a couple of uh, the stitches in uh, the knitted part. And then uh, I finish it up with one or three two or three rows of slip stitches to get in some other colors. And here I have the reverse single crochet. And uh, here I have the reverse uh, puff stitches. These uh, uh, front bands or button bands, they're very stable and they're not very thick. And uh, you can, if there are little, if the knitting is a little too loose or a little too tight, you can kind of adjust it to with the, the crochet stitches. Yeah, it gives it a nice, that's the same with this one, it gives it a really nice firm border. Yes. So you can see that's the knitted part there mm -hmm. and that's the crochet yes. part. Exactly. And here on the back side yeah. you can, you you cover up the sticks. Yeah. And uh, I try to cut most of the excess uh, yarn so it doesn't get, if it if you have a lot of sticks inside, it gets a little thick. Yeah. So it's... Uh, that's lying flat, mm. isn't it? Yeah, that's why I also always all sew. I don't just cut. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. I need, yeah. so you sew with a sewing machine. Yes, I do. On your, on your mm. sticks, yeah. Mm. Okay, well, it's been a really great little window again into your work. It's just a little mini interview today, but yes. it's great to show the audience with all the colourful ways that you embellish your beautiful garments. So thank you for being with us. And thank you for inviting me. Great. Okay, we'll say goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>
So welcome back. Now before I forget that very beautiful melodic music you just heard is a tribute to Sissel because it's by Norway's most famous composer Edvard Grieg. That was the Pier Gimp Suite. We've had it on the show before. It's really beautiful. So I hope you enjoyed seeing those extra bits of crochet and embroidery and how how gorgeously ornate Sissel's designs are. They really are my cup of tea. <laughs> yeah. And like I said in the interview, the, the garment that I was wearing during the interview, which is this one here, is one of Sissel's designs. It's called Mother Erst. I'm not pronouncing the Erst correctly, but it was dedicated to Sissel's mother. And she knitted the, or she designed the, the design to be a long jacket going down to the lower hips. And I turned it into a cropped jacket here. And I also put a little collar on it. And this garment has actually ended up being one of my most successful and, and favorite designs out of all of my garments. I'm really, really happy with it. I love it. I think it's kind of a, a timeless jacket. And, uh, and the yarn is Ask, which she spoke about. It's from the Norwegian uh, Woolen Mill Hillersvog. And this yarn, I can highly recommend. It is absolutely no pilling on it. You can probably see, but it, it's just beautiful. It's, it's very long lasting. It wears very well. There's nothing, no pilling anywhere. It's, I'm totally thrilled with it. Yeah, looks like new. It does. It really and I does. Can, I can imagine that in 10 yeah. years' time, it'll look just the same. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And like I said, there's a, the, the crochet button band that we spoke about as well, which was fun. It was, it was a real fun technique to do back then. And it was interesting to see the embroidery for me. I hope you enjoyed it. The last time I did embroidery was when I was about 11 or 12, I think. And we did learn most of the stitches that she showed you there. So we definitely learned the French knot, the duplicate stitch and the chain stitch. And yeah, I'm kind of intrigued to do it again. Mm -hmm. So I think I might have to do another one of Sissel's projects. Now, Sissel is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount off everything in her online store. And Sissel sells her designs in a kit, which includes the pattern, the yarn, and often the extra buttons, ribbons, and sequences that are part of the design. And she really just has stunningly beautiful designs. So I think you'll all enjoy browsing through her collection just for inspiration. Mm. Now we do ask our viewers to please support the show by becoming a patron. This is our full-time work, even in lockdown, and the show's only possible through the financial support of patrons. And you can become a patron for a small amount each month, just the price of a coffee, which isn't that much for the majority of people. And every single patron makes a big difference to us particularly now. So please do make that effort to become a patron. And thank you so much to all of the wonderful viewers who have done that and made this show possible so far. So we have a wide range of knitting skills and experience amongst our viewers. And some of our viewers are fairly new to knitting and particularly new to knitting a garment. And it's obvious that it's so much more effort, time, and um, even money goes into knitting a garment. And sometimes they can be a little bit nervous about investing all of that into a garment and then have something go wrong with it. And uh, so one of the questions we've received a few times is how do we wash, care for, and store our garments? And as you know, I love knitting garments. I've knitted so many of them. I probably should be a little bit guilty. Here's a selection of my garments that I've knitted for myself. So I've knitted, as I said, 25 woolen garments for myself. I've also knitted about four or five summer tops that are blends of silk, cotton, or, or linen. I've knitted Andrew about, I've got a little bit of mohair in my eye, it's so annoying. <laughs> Sorry about this. I've knitted Andrew about four or five garments, and I've knitted Madeline since she's an adult about four or five garments. So that's a lot of jumpers. And I'm really happy to say, and I hope I don't jinx the situation, that so far we haven't had a tragedy, either with washing or with moths. So I really hope it stays that way. That could be the fact that we live in an area that maybe there's not a lot of moths, so that could be to our advantage. But I thought I'd just tell you how we take care of our garments, and that might give you some confidence if you're concerned. So you've probably heard you don't need to wash your hand knits much. That's true. I only wash my jumpers at the most once a year. But just to, to um, qualify that, 
I wear my garments every day, but I, I never wear them directly on my skin. So I've usually got a thin cotton um, garment, you know, top underneath yep. or a thin uh, woolen spencer, something underneath. And I'm just going to talk really directly to you. That's because obviously if I sweat and you've got bacteria in sweat, most of that is going into the cotton or, or the woolen top underneath and not the garment. So that helps to keep the garment a lot cleaner. If I'm wearing a tight fitting top like this one I'm and I've worn it a lot and I'm sweating in it a lot and even sitting on the couch here doing a podcast, I will sweat a lot. <laughs> uh, so I might hand wash just this sort of underarm area just gently maybe twice or three times a year at the most okay even socks now I'm really precious with with a cotton sock I will never it's really icky for me to put on a cotton sweat sock twice in a row without washing it like I will have a fresh pair of socks every day but with wool woolen socks I can easily wear them four or five um, days in a row without feeling icked out <laughs> okay so the other thing that really helps your garments stay clean is that I will always wear a full apron when I'm cooking because even when you're cooking you might get fine splats of or sprays of fat or protein on that you won't even see but it'll be there and that might attract moths or insects or, or just make the garment dirtier over time. So there's those things that help to keep the garment um, cleaner. Now I wash all of our hand knits in the washing machine. But we have a really good quality modern washing machine and I wash them all on a very gentle wool wash. And how I do it is I will take a jumper, I'll turn it inside out and I'll stick it in a mesh lingerie bag and I might uh, wash about four or five garments at the same time in one load. So each will be turned inside out and each will be in their own laundry bag. A reason why I turn them inside out is so if there is any friction it's happening on the inside of the garment not the outside. Which is, which is a good thing. And I'll just put them in four or five at a time and, and put them right through the cycle. There's two really, really important things that I think are the most important things to think about. The first one is the water temperature. The temperature of the water in the wash cycle has to be exactly the same as the temperature of the water in the rinse cycle. So even if you've got a modern machine like ours, you can put the, the, the wash cycle on say 20 degrees, which is really just lukewarm or, or 30 degrees, whatever, but that's fine. You don't know that your machine is going to put out the same degrees in the rinse cycle as it does in the wash cycle. And if there's a temperature difference there, that's where the, sh the shrinking and the felting occurs. So I always just put the temperature right completely off so it's, it's the, the temperature of the water coming straight from the tap, both the on the wash cycle and the rinse, rinse cycle. So that is hugely important. The second thing is to use a really good quality wool or cashmere wash. And there's a, a ton of them on the, on the market which are really good brands. So I just happen to use a German one called Tenemol and I just buy it on the internet. But there's, it doesn't really matter. You can just find a good brand. If you can afford to buy wool, you can afford to buy a, wool, a, a top quality wool wash. It's that important because you're not going to wash them very often, just once a year, and, and that really helps. Okay, so what else about the washing machine? The, the spin cycle for a wool wash is usually 700 uh, rounds per minute, and I've never had a problem with that. I've just got this mohair <laughs> in my eye, I'm which oh, I think I might have got it. Fantastic. Okay, so I've never had a problem with that. So I just put the woolens in their bag, wash them, spin them, take them out, take them out of their bag, turn them the right side out, way out, and then lay them flat on a towel and pat them into shape. And you can either dry them outside in the shade, so away from direct sunlight, or inside as long as it's away from a direct source of heat. So you don't want to put them in front of a fire or in front of a heater that's going to blow hot air in one direction. Again, it's all about the temperature change. You can even put your um, woolens to dry in a spare room that's not even heated, that could be cold. It'll just take an extra couple of days to dry. And so just after one and a half days, turn it over, pat it down and let it dry on the other side. Sometimes I've forgotten about my woolens drying and come back a week later in a room and seeing them there. Okay, so that's the washing. Now, if you do want to hand wash because you don't have a good machine or you just don't trust it, you can do that as well. 
there's a few things, again, the two most important things. Water temperature has to be the same between the wash and the rinse water. The Yeah, wash and rinse water and also a good quality um, detergent. Ooh. The other thing is, once you put it in, if I, for instance, if I'm hand washing under the arm area, you don't want to rub. You don't want to be doing this. That's wrong. But you can squeeze gently just to make sure that the sudsy water is getting through, you know, so you could squeeze in that area or if there's a stain or if you want to dis, dis, help to dislodge the, the dirt, you can squeeze a bit like that and that's fine. So you, you can even leave your jumper in a bucket of sudsy water or in a basin of sudsy water for two or three hours. Just leave it there to soak and that'll really do a thorough cleaning. But if you do it that long, those wool fibers will be so thoroughly saturated with water that there can be a problem that if you pull the garment out, those, those fibers will already be weak because they're completely saturated with water and the stretching can happen when you're pulling the garment out because of the weight of the water on the fibers. So if that happens, what you want to do is take out the garment in small portions and wring it. So you don't want to be doing this, that's wrong. But you can just say this is in a bucket of water. I would take the sleeve out and I would just take it a little bit like this and I would just squeeze it down like that. So I'm getting the water out and then I put that sleeve over the side of the bucket or the side of the basin. I find the other sleeve, do the same thing. So I'm getting as much water out before I lift it up and, and have the water drag on it. And then you go from the top of the jumper, just squeezing it down like that and gradually out so so you're not sort of getting it to stretch like that so that that's my tips for hand washing the next thing is moths and storage so it, like i said i wear them most uh, nearly every single day all yep. year and moths don't and larva which is the eggs don't like to be disturbed and they don't like direct sunlight so the fact that i'm rummaging in my co my cupboards often and pulling new garments out is probably to my advantage if you live in a warmer climate than we do and you want to store your garments away for three months or so you should store them away clean because moths like dirty clothes more than they like clean clothes but you also want to clean out your cupboard you want to make sure all of the dust is gone because Half of that dust is probably just dead skin cells, which is protein and that's what moths like to eat. So don't just sort of brush it out, get a wet cloth and really go over all of the edges of the cupboard to completely get out every single bit of dust. So you've got a super clean cupboard, super clean clothes, and then you can put in things like lavender bags or moth balls if you wanna to go toxic. Cedar balls are less toxic, obviously, or you can also do moth paper. I use moth paper. That's also toxic, but it's kind of fail-safe, safe, but you have to change them out every six, six months or so. Now, if you happen to see a moth flying around your cupboard and you're going to have a heart attack, attack and you don't know whether that moth has laid eggs yet because it's the eggs that eat the wool fiber, not the moths, what you can do is get your jumper and stick it in a plastic bag or a Ziploc bag and stick it in the deep freeze overnight. So it's frozen in the morning, take it out and thaw it and then repeat the process. So the garment's been frozen twice and thawed twice. That will kill the eggs and then you fail safe. So I hope that's been fairly comprehensive for you and it gives those of you who are nervous about washing and caring for garments that you've put a huge amount of time into more confidence. Yep, good. Um, it's a really strange time at the moment with, um, you know, it's almost like time stands still and you don't know, you can't plan for the future and you don't know what's going to be possible in the next couple of months. Nevertheless, we're really excited to have been invited to the Prince Edward Island Fibre Festival. It's the first one. It's taking place in Canada, of course, in late September this year. The festival has offered to pay for our flights, which is really nice, means that we can go. Yeah. So all things going well. We'll be heading off to Canada late September this year. We'll be covering the events at the festival. We'll be interviewing some of the local fibre artists, and there are a lot there mm -hmm. in Prince Edward Island. And we'll also, we're really excited about meeting some of you. Anyone who will be there will be meeting up with you. There is a special event organized where we'll be there and other guests, and it's just so that you can meet up with us. So yeah. that's a really great thing to have organized. 
If you're interested in finding out about more about the Fiverr Festival, the link to the website is in the description below, and I think we're putting it on the screen. Uh, yeah. yeah. Something like that. And we'll also let you know a bit more about what we're doing as time goes by. Yeah, definitely. So I'm really looking forward to it, and yeah, I'm optimistic that it's going to go ahead as yes. planned. <laughs> Okay, so coming up now is our main feature interview with the natural dyer Rhea Burns. Rhea is very, very passionate about dyeing with plants and it seems that dyeing with plants is a real art form, which is interesting to me. And what's, what I found also particularly interesting is Rhea has very stringent tests to make sure that the dyes that she uses are light fast and wash fast. And so they go through stringent tests before she'll do her designs in them. And I thought yep. that was really interesting. And she also does classes for, for natural dyeing. So after this lockdown is f forby or, or gone, <laughs> <laughs> if you live in the UK, that might be some fun activity for you to do in the weekend. You might want to look that up. I think it looks like a, a lot of fun. Yep. Okay, so thank you so much for spending time with us again. It's been a real pleasure for us. Hope it's been a pleasure for you. And we'll see you in two weeks. Yep. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Bye. Knitting. I'm in Shetland for the Wool Week and with me is Rhea Burns who is teaching classes and giving a talk during the festival and Rhea has completed her Masters in uh, Textiles and Design and then she launched her knitwear brand a year ago via a crowdfunded uh, campaign and she's creating fun and colourful machine knitted garments and accessories using wool from a local farm which she then hand dyes with food wastes, forage plants and plants from her own back garden. So just from what I've said you can probably guess that creating sustainable knitwear is really important to Ria and we'll talk more about that during the interview. So it's great to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thank Thanks you. For me. So we have got some of, of Ria's designs here in front of us. So can you just talk about them and tell us how you build sustainability into your design process? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really important to work with wool, um, just in general as a fibre, because I think it's incredibly um, sustainable. It's renewable. It's biodegradable. And then also I wanted to focus on the wool that we could get from within the UK because I think that's a real untapped resource, mm -hmm. uh, especially for clothing here. Um, and I also discovered as I was doing my research that there were so many natural shades of British wool sheep breeds um, that I really wanted to sort of champion that within my knitwear. So as well as doing the hand dyeing, I've also left quite a, a lot of the knitwear undyed. So you can see on this jumper here, which is um, called the Beton Jumper, which is French for concrete, which is then Beton Brut, which was brutalism. So it's basically my influence was brutalist architecture. And this is kind of reflected in the natural grey, which is a blue faced Leicester Gotland blend yarn mm -hmm. that I've machine knitted on a double bed industrial knitting machine. And these sort of like really bold columns here um, and the way it zigzag kind of reflects the architecture I was inspired by. And this was contrasted with um, a lot of uh, research and photography from the natural world. Um, just before I started my master's, I went to Isla in the Inner Hebrides and I just was completely inspired by the landscape, the sort of rock formations and how that was contrasted with like soft grasses and then the bright pops of colour from the lichen. So this is why the sleeves are really soft in a really chunky hand knit. It's um, three yarns uh, twisted together 
that have been uh, dyed with rhubarb root and weld, and then one's also left undyed in a sort of real soft texture mm. to really contrast with the with the grey. And then the sort of pops of yellow and orange here are to sort of reflect the lichen and um, also to showcase the natural plant dyes and yeah. how bright they can be. And right now in Shetland, uh, the lichen is really this colour. It's really... Um, blooming at the moment yeah. yeah yeah it's amazing it's gorgeous and it's a cropped one yeah yeah it's, it's great a cropped, okay kind of boxy shape and over here is a skirt mm -hmm. this is really stunning <laughs> okay so i'll hold it like that yeah. and you can tell us about it yeah so this one um i just i like making slightly unexpected knitwear so i think there's not a lot of knitted skirts and dresses so much so that was something I always want to do. I kind of want to challenge the, the preconceptions of knitwear and then sort of what you can do with British wool yeah. and also with the natural dyes. So when I show this to people and I say it's naturally dyed, they don't always believe me. Yeah. And I kind of almost have to like get, not get my samples out and things and sort of tell them. Um, the inspiration for this piece is quite a bit odd, actually. So it's such the um, sort of... Uh, uh, hem pieces here mm -hmm. are actually influenced from uh, some uh, hazard tape at the recycling centre. Okay. <laughs> um, it was just such this bright colour and then behind that was all this uh, compressed uh, like tins and things. Yeah. Uh, and I just thought that looked absolutely stunning. Um, and then I played around with that with lots of drawing and things and sampling and then combined it with uh, the bright blue from indigo going back to my original research from the natural world so I'm really combining the man-made and the natural with my work yeah and if you look closely what I really like is that it's not so variegated this yellow color that looks pretty saturated but yeah. the blue is more variegated and that sort of looks nice with the stripes doesn't it yeah it creates this really optic effect yeah. um, and that's actually made just by doing quite a simple dip dye so half of the hank of yarn which is a natural gray uh, has been dipped in a weld dye bath which has made the yellow and then after that i've then dipped the other half into uh, indigo vat to create the the blue um, but I've also left a little bit in the middle just to leave a bit of the undyed grey. Yeah, sense. that's yeah. really clever. Wow. Okay. And then we've got a cowl here. So, yeah, this is uh, kind of where I am now as a designer. And it's kind of had a bit of a, I've had a bit of a shift as to how it's worked because this is knitted with my new yarn, which is a local wool yarn. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's also dyed with plants that I've grown in my own garden. So I'm finding now I'm a little bit more dictated by what I have so what's in season? So at the moment, I've got quite a lot of orange, which is this Coriopsis mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And then also here, which is um, from Cosmos. So kind of similar colour, but slightly different. And is that your natural shade? Of yarn? Yeah, that yeah. is. Yeah. So it's, it's quite it's, creamy, actually. Yeah. So it's a natural white. So it's been sorted from the sort of white uh, fleece from yeah. the lamb's wool. And it's not been bleached or, or dyed yeah. or anything. So it has these lovely heathery flecks running through it. It does. Yeah, which gets me on to your, your actual custom-made yarn. How did that come about and, and tell us about it? Yes, yeah, so it was a, pretty much just after I finished my master's. I'd done all this research and sort of found out what sort of breeds and things worked well for me. Um, but I still didn't quite have that full traceability and like ownership of my supply chain. Um, so I um, was introduced to a farmer, yeah. uh, Jen, uh, who um, has a... Uh, eco farm on the Mendips which it, it in Somerset and it's like about 15 miles away from my house very local uh, very local <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's from different cross breeds of Shetland is that right yes yeah so they have a flock of about 3,000 in total wow. it's quite quite a big farm it's like an yeah. Australian farm <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah and they're mostly all Shetland cross yeah um because they've uh, bred the sheep over the years to be beneficial both for their meat and for their fleece mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So like you said, it's got this nice heathered look, mm -hmm. which comes out really well with, with dyes on top. And it's two-ply, isn't it? It is a two-ply, yeah. yeah. Um, and do you know what gauge it knits up to? Yeah, so it's slightly different terminology with machine knitting. So my yarn is a two-ply in that it is two ends of yarn plied together. But it kind of knits up to roughly a uh, fingering or like a light four-ply kind of weight if you were to hand knit with it. Okay. And you can see sort of on the cone, it's quite, um, it looks a lot thinner than when it's washed. This is because it's oiled on the cone so that it runs through my knitting machine really smoothly. But then when you wash it, it just blooms and becomes really bouncy and fluffy because it's the first clip lambswool from their sheep. It's got all these lovely qualities yeah. and it's really soft. 
It is. It looks lovely. When you were first learning about natural dyeing, who influenced you the most? Mm -hmm. Um, so my first major influence was probably actually a natural dyer, uh, very local to me in Bristol, uh, called Babs Behan. Mm -hmm. I um, just did a workshop with her. That was my first experience of natural dyeing. Um, and that really kind of opened my eyes to the world of, of dyeing and the potential of plants, which was amazing. And she recommended this book to me, which okay. is uh, Wild Colour by Jenny Dean. Yeah. This is the um, book that I've been recommending to all my students okay. this week. So it has some historical context, which is great, but then it also goes through the process. Because the thing about natural dyeing is you do have to do quite a lot of preparation to the yarn or fibre in order to get it to absorb the dye. So it takes you through the process of scouring, which is basically washing, but a lot more intense to kind of get rid of any impurities and oils. And then it also talks you through the mordanting process. And mordants are what you use to get the dye to adhere to the yarn or fibre. Yeah. yeah, okay. Now, you also mentioned um, a book that was written 100 years ago. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that was, uh, it's called A Book on Vegetable Dyes by Ethel Mare. And yeah, it was written about 100 years ago. And it was a really interesting time in terms of dyeing history because chemical dyes have started to become really prevalent. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't very happy with that. She felt that dyeing had kind of been lost as an art form and it had become very scientific and very bland and the colours were very flat and saturated. And so she wrote this book, which is very poetic, actually. I would recommend anyone read it. It's really beautiful. Um, just as a sort of um, rebellion against this sort of new way of dyeing and just to remind people the beauty of plant dyeing and how it is an art form. So it's quite interesting for me to have a book like Wild Colour by Jenny Dean because she talks so much about sort of thorough note taking, mm -hmm. testing dyes to make sure they don't fade, so the light fastness and then mm -hmm. for washing, the wash fastness. But then also coming back to it being a very beautiful and a very organic, lovely thing to do as a practice. Say something a bit more about the light fast and wash fast. Mm. How do you how do you do that? How do you control that? Yeah. So whenever I'm trying a new dye, um, I will uh, basically dye dye some yarn in the in the sort of normal way that I do, and then you for the light fastness, you essentially kind of uh, wrap some yarn around a card and you trap some of that within a window of um, like black card basically, leaving some of the yarn exposed, and then you'll leave it on a sunny windowsill for. Uh, I usually do about a month so it's quite an extreme test yeah. it's not necessarily the kind of testing that your normal clothing would go, go through, through but yeah. I just think I might as well if, if I can mm. and really push it and then after that you can take it out and you see how much it has faded and so if it hasn't faded a lot then it's a dye that I will use in my clothing because I think it's really important that um, I make something that is going to last a long time that people yeah. are going to want to keep and uh, the wash fastness is, is literally just like, will it leach out into the water when you wash it? Now, Ria has transformed her back garden into a really productive organic dye garden. So what are the pros and cons of natural dyeing from your back garden for an actual commercial business? So I'll just talk about how my garden got started. Um, so going back to the, your intro and the crowdfunder, that was yeah. basically raised the funds to start the garden. So that was the kind of start the financial starting point and then I worked with my mother who is a horticulturalist so she uh, nurtured all of the plants from seed for me because she has a much larger space she also has a very large greenhouse and also the knowledge to kind of look after things a bit longer than me perhaps mm. and then they were um, handed to me she lives about two hours drive away um, when they were mature enough to sort of go into the, my garden we chose plants that would thrive the best in my climate. So I live in southwest England, so it can be quite warm, but we can also be quite wet and windy. Mm. So they need to be quite hardy. And luckily, most of the native UK dye plants are like that. Yeah. So we are growing uh, the three primary colours as a start. So we've got Weld, which is this yellow here, uh, Woad for blue, and then also Madder, um, which is this red here. Um, but I can't actually show you anything from my own madder plants yet because they take several years to mature. So I will be harvesting madder next year and then doing annual plantings to make sure I have a reliable source of that. Wow, how yeah. exciting. <laughs> so you really need to know your colours to be able to mix the three mm -hmm. primaries well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, it kind of goes right back to the colour theory from, from art school and things. So yeah, it's really, really interesting in that respect. 
Um, but I've also grown some more kind of floral crops that I knew would be ready this year. So I would have some things to die with. Um, and the biggest success has been Coreopsis. Um, which is a flower. There's a variety called Coreopsis tinctoria. And uh, if it has tinctoria at the end, it means it's a dye plant, essentially. Okay. And that's produced this beautiful orange here. Mm. Um, and yeah, there's some of my dried flowers here. And here it is here. Yeah. Wow. That's a really deep colour, isn't it? Yeah, it's And that looks really well saturated. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. Um, it's very very vibrant. I was really surprised to get that from my fresh plants so much. It'll be interesting to see kind of as the uh, autumn and winter develops, how the yarn dies with the plants that I've dried. So this one is dyed with fresh. Okay. And then I've also been freezing some and then drying for over winter. So. Now tell me a little bit about woad because mm. that's an alternative for in indigo. Isn't yeah. It? So woad is the more kind of traditional dye, uh, blue dye plant for the UK, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's quite got quite a lot of history behind it, um, and so I decided to grow that one this year because I thought it would be quite easy to grow, which it has been definitely. Mm -hmm. um, my issue is, unfortunately, with what, what I've grown this year is it's not, I don't think it's had enough sun. So I've kind of struggled to get the blue out of the plants that I wanted to. Um, my garden is quite small. Um, it, it basically was my lawn, so it's a square um, with four raised beds in it. So I had to really think about which plants needed to be where for the most amount of sun. And I don't think the woad got enough sun this year. Okay, because I would imagine that those kind of dye plants actually do well with a lot of sun. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, quite a lot of them do need full sun. There's, there's not yeah. so many that um, like the shade. So we've got a baby blue. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of that was from a, um, a method a sort of fresh leaf indigo um, extract, because indigo is the sort of name of the pigment within the plant, so that mm -hmm. applies to woad too. Um, you do a fresh ex leaf extraction with salt. Mm -hmm. You rub salt into fresh woad leaves that makes a kind of pulp. Then you rub it into the fibre, and it does the, the magical kind of indigo oxidation of going from green to blue over the course of uh, several hours. And then within a couple of days, I had this nice soft blue. But it's not quite as strong as I was hoping for, I think because of the, the lack of sunlight in the plants. Um, but I am also thinking about possibly trying to grow some indigo next year. There's one variety that I have seen dyes in the UK grow. So I think um, if I can get a little bit more space in my mum's garden next year, we'll, we'll, we'll try for some indigo to get some deeper blues. I would imagine you need a fair, a lot of plant to sort of concentrate down to get a fairly small amount of colour. Is that mm. true? Like, how it, how will you look in the future to make it um, viable on a commercial mm -hmm. scale? Yeah. So the general rule of thumb for plant dyeing is it's equal uh, weight of plant to weight of fibre. Mm -hmm. That's not always true. That's something you kind of learn with experience and trying. And it also depends what intensity of colour you want. Um, so to get this really saturated orange here from the Coreopsis, I will, I've used half of uh, fresh to the weight of fibre, so 50%, so 50 grams fresh flowers to 100 grams fibre. So that's made that really intense colour, mm. which was really surprising for me actually the first time I tried it to get something so rich. Mm. Um, and the test will kind of be over winter, thinking about viability is, for my business, is, to, is whether my dried and frozen stocks will actually sort of see me through the winter. So that's something we'll kind of have to just see as the, as the year goes on really and then next year perhaps think about trying to get some more space if needed. You might have to rent a plot. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm thinking about getting an allotment, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but it's fantastic that you've got a mother who knows all about gardening. What a yeah. lucky, I was going to say what a lucky find, but you didn't find your mum. <laughs> That probably was in some way a bit of an influence from the start. Oh, it? absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, um, she's a very keen knitter and and dressmaker as well so I've definitely got my whole creativity from her too so yeah. I owe a lot to her definitely. That's great. Okay now can you show us some of the different ways that natural dyes can be applied to yarn just to create different beautiful effects and things? Mm -hmm. um, so this piece here is a kind of sampler that I made at the end of my MA to kind of showcase all the different colours I'd achieved but then also the, the natural sheep shades but I'll focus on the sort of natural dye colour here. Um, so this one in the middle here is again the sort of dip dye that you saw in that skirt to start with only the dye bars were a lot less saturated so yeah. the colour's a bit more subtle I've also left a lot more grey yeah. undyed in the middle 
Um, and this sort of section here, this bright green and yellow, this is uh, a base of weld, so for the yellow. And then I've dyed uh, half of the hank in an indigo vat. So that's made green. And that's kind of the best way to make green. A lot of the um, plants that can make green, such as nettles, are actually not very light fast. So if you want to get a really strong permanent green, you'll dye with a yellow first and then over dye with indigo or woad. So it adds an extra layer of process to the, to the um, finished piece. And there's another green here, which is the same uh, method. Um, only the dye that's underneath is a lot paler in terms of the okay. yellow. So that's why it looks more bluey. Yeah, blue so green. it's ended up kind of more, more blue. Um, the dye there is actually from carrot tops. So sort of trying to think of the sort of food waste and things that I've used. Um, that makes a really nice sort of pale yellow, which it then put into an indigo vat can really change. You can see the difference in greens is quite, quite good. Carrot tops. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> what about this mustard? That is from uh, pomegranate skins. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> How bizarre. Yeah, that's quite an interesting one. Um, it's um, it's a really great dye stuff, actually. You do obviously need to collect quite a few pomegranate skins, and it's not something I'd recommend you just go and buy in the shops if you're UK-based, because obviously it's been imported, so it's not great sustainability-wise. But if you eat them, we know a cafe or something mm. that can get things like that for you. It's a great one to use, because it actually doesn't require a mordant to... Um, for the colour to adhere to the yarn. It's um, what we call a substantive dye, which is called the category of dyes that don't require a mordant. There's and quite a few uh, that, there's quite a few. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, a lot of the kind of tannin-based ones, so things like walnut for a, a nice brown. Yes. Yeah. And what about avocado, pips and... and yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great dye to use. That is also a substantive one um, because it has some tannins in it. Um, but I tend, when I dye with it, I tend to use uh, it with a mordant because it kind of helps enhance the colour. Mm -hmm. And um, it can fade a little bit, that one. So. And have you done berries? Like my grandmother used yeah. to use um, mulberry berry, mm -hmm. and that was a really deep pink. Have you tried m many berries? Or? I have done, yeah, in yeah. my sort of initial experiments because I was sort of using what I could find. Yeah. Um, and that's really great as a kind of uh, learning curve. Um, but unfortunately, they do fade Okay, um, yeah. over time so it's, it's not one I would recommend it's, and it's not something I would use in my uh, finished pieces yeah. that's for sure but it's really fun to play around with yeah, yeah. okay so what about this bright aqua yeah <laughs> that's um, probably the most impressive color you can get from a natural dye for sure um, it is a liquid indigo um, so indigo as a pigment is insoluble and you normally have to make a, a kind of vat and put it into certain circumstances in order to get colour out of it but this is um this is actually the only dye that I do buy in ready-made because the process of making it into a liquid is quite complex and not something I'm quite ready to do just yet um so it, it comes as a liquid and it kind of then behaves like an acid dye almost so you use quite a small amount mm -hmm. in the dye bath you get this beautiful turquoise colour um and then the sort of the water is left clear and you can rinse it out and I love it as a colour but I'm not sure it's it kind of giving me the joy of the dying. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of loses like... a bit of the, the the magic and the, the art of it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. I can I can understand that. And you've got all of the different natural shades, yeah. which um, actually also affects the colour. And you've got examples of that here, haven't you? Yeah, I have. So this is what I was teaching in one of my workshops at Wool Week, um, at Jameson and Smith. Uh, we were using the Shetland Natural Heritage range, which is, um, I think, seven shades now of an undyed uh, Shetland yarn, ranging from white to uh, what's called Shetland black. Mm. It's the darkest mm. you can get. Um, we worked with every colour apart from the Shetland black because from testing that would not take any dye at all. Um, so this swatch here is the natural white. Um, these are all dyed with weld. Um, so that's the natural white. This one here is uh, the grey, the light grey. So that this one, one here? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you can just see the sort of lovely tones that's running through it. Mm -hmm. It really helps kind of soften the... Sometimes world can be a little bit harsh. Mm -hmm. It depends what kind of effect Neon. you want. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this one here is the... This uh, dark grey. The dark grey, that's it, yeah. And that, um, that yarn has actually been dip-dyed. So you can kind of see the... 
yellow popping through. And I just think that makes a really nice effect. My students were really surprised yesterday to see that yellow come through on such a dark shade. You've got some other samples yes. here. What can you tell us about those? So this is um, a test basically of the different uh, ways of preparing the yarn before and then also how you treat it afterwards. So with natural dyeing, there's so many different variables. Uh, the, the water quality, there's all <laughs> so many things. The mordant you've used, yeah. the alkalinity. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to learn <laughs> and a lot of variants. So we made um, several different uh, mini skeins of yarn that were different colours, but it's all the same dye material. So this is rhubarb root here. This first first one, uh, there's no mordant whatsoever. So that's And just, just sorry, just before yeah. we start, is this a, a white yarn or like it's a, a Shetland white or what is it? It's an uh, ecru kind of colour, so a okay. little bit creamy, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's had no mordant whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's So that's just made a really nice colour. Rhubarb root is a substantive dye, so okay. it can be used without a mordant, which is So light fast know. and wash fast without any mordant. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I personally prefer to use it with a mordant because it helps brighten the colours a little bit. Okay. Um, so as you see from this one here, this one has been mordanted with um, a plant-based mordant, uh, which is called Simplocos, and that's a natural source of alum. And alum is kind of one of the most common mordants that are used because it's quite non-toxic and it's relatively safe and it helps um, the uptake of dye and it really brightens the colours. So it's made this really lovely golden colour, which mm. is really nice. Uh, the third one here is, again, it's been mordanted before the dyeing, like this one here, but with copper. Copper, yeah. okay. So you can use copper. Um, you have to be obviously a little bit careful with that. Um, you can use sort of copper sulfate powder or you can make your own with like some copper piping and, and a vinegar solution. Um, you just have to sort of take some care with that and particularly with the disposal afterwards. Mm. But that modifies the colour um, to sort of this really rich brown here, which is yeah. quite interesting. And the fourth one here is um, has not been mordanted before but it's been modified afterwards. So after you can change things after you've dyed. So if you get a colour you're not quite happy with, you can play around with things to get the result that you want. So after the dyeing of the rhubarb root with this yarn, we've modified it with some iron. So again, using uh, iron sulphate powder or a homemade mm -hmm. uh, jar of mordant with some rusty nails in or something. <laughs> um, and that, and that, it, it does what it's, it's... A lot of people describe it as saddening the colour, mm -hmm. which is a, an interesting one. But um, I, d I don't know. This I think this green that I've got here, it's sort of greeny brown. There's lots of different tones going on in there. I think it's yeah. really interesting. You do have to be quite careful with iron if you're using wool because um, it can degrade the... Okay, the, the fibres. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to kind of get that in the dye bath for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and then take it out and thoroughly rinse it. And then also be careful with the disposal of the, the leftover liquid. So, yeah, you need to take a bit of caution with that one. <laughs> this final two are all to do with the pH of the dye bath. So that's not every dye is pH sensitive, mm -hmm. but quite a lot of them are. And you just kind of learn that through doing. So I've always got a little uh, digital pH monitor with me just to see, because that can really affect the outcome. So this one here has been modified um, to be made more acidic. Mm -hmm. So I've just used some clear vinegar in the dye bath and just increased the yeah the, the pH up to more acidic and that turns it more towards yellow. So that's really interesting. <laughs> so if you didn't like this, mm. you could go and put yet another mordant on it and change it. Yeah, you could you could play endlessly. With it. Essentially, Almost. yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm not sure how happy the yarn would be yeah. by the end of it I think you'd have to <laughs> be quite careful um when you're doing any kind of modifying always do it a little bit and then a bit more don't just I wouldn't recommend just throwing loads of vinegar in straight away because then it can be a little bit hard to sort of strip it back yeah back down um and the final one here is going the other way so it's um increasing the alkalinity um to, so I've used uh, washing soda here, um, or it's sometimes called soda crystals, depends mm -hmm. where you're from, it's like sodium carbonate. Mm -hmm. But you can use um, chalk 
um, or ammonia. There's a few different things you can do there to adjust that, and that makes this really ready colour. And very quickly, would you have to grow a lot of root for that? Yes, you would. Yeah, it's an, um, it's, it's an interesting one because essentially you have to destroy the plant in order to um, get the root. Yeah. But um, you would need quite a lot of rhubarb. Um, this is why I'm thinking about getting an allotment in particular yes. next year. Um, but the rhubarb's a really good dye plant, actually, um, for the root. But then you can also use the leaves to make a mordant. So okay. it's quite a useful plant. You're using to have every around. bit of it. Yeah, and then you eat the stems, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so actually that leads me to the last question because we do unfortunately need to wrap it up. <laughs> Sustainability is really important to you, mm. obviously. Can you give us some tips about how to help us become more, say, environmentally aware and responsible crafters? Okay, yeah. Um, my main point that I always say to anyone that um, buys my knitwear or is interested in sustainability, um, just thinking it most about the end use of the thing that you have. So if you're buying a, a sweater, for example, um, really care for it, really look after it. Um, think about how it's laundered. Don't wash it quite so often, perhaps, mm -hmm. at a lower temperature. Make sure it's stored well over winter. Uh, not over winter. <laughs> over well, summer, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the UK, there's not much difference. Yeah. <laughs> Between winter and summer, you can wear your garments on all year. Yeah. Um, uh, so storing things correctly, mm -hmm. um, sort of in a cool, dark place, especially if it's naturally dyed, don't leave it in the window or anything yeah. like that. Uh, and make sure it's kind of protected against moths and things like that because you uh, wouldn't want something to come out sort of mm. when winter hits and uh, yeah. find massive holes in it. Well, if it does have holes in it, then repair it. Mm. Um, I'm quite lucky um, where I live uh, and in my studio, we have a monthly uh, mending event. It's like a social event. People come in with all the holy jumpers and we sort of teach each other and share skills and kind of encourage the repair and longevity of our, our pieces basically. That sounds like yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah it's a great it's a great thing definitely. <laughs> well it's been really fantastic to have you on Fruity Knitting so I really appreciate you sharing our knowledge your knowledge with us that's great. Thank you. Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye! Bye. <laughs>